And welcome once again to In Retrospection, the show where we review the retro today. I am Joshua Caleb, and joining me, I have three guests in lieu of Zach, who last I heard from him was still on Planet Zebus, so ho hopefully he, he gets back safe. But joining me today, I have Joel Brodsky making his triumphant return. Hello. And also, once again, I have Curtis Boyle. Hello, all. And a new guest, Matt Lucas. Hi, everybody. Who apparently is a wolf. Apparently. Yes, he, he, he is Uncle Big Bad. All right, so today we're changing gears, um, literally and figuratively, from our platforming series and going to dive into some racing games. And to start off, we have a very old racing game. I believe this was, you were telling me about this one, Curtis. This was before, they, or the, this was the last game to actually have a, to not have a to not, to not have a CPU in it. Yeah, it was actually done with all TTL logic chips. Uh, if you've seen pictures, there's a couple pictures on the web of the circuit boards that make this thing up. They're huge. They have hundreds of chips on them all to simulate basically a microprocessor. Yeah, and I, I was actually amazed how they were able to do this without an actual processor yeah. in there. <laughs> what I was amazed with was how many quarters I dumped into this machine as soon as it turned night, I couldn't see anything <laughs> except for the small cone in front of the car. Yeah, and, and my worst part, I think, was the ice driving, because when you tried to steer oh, up and right, it just you whipped over and hit things. And, and no matter what happened, it would always spin 360 degrees. So yeah. if you hit something, you've got to have the reaction time of a saint or something to be able to hit something, spin 360, and then find out where you're going to be, not where you are, and then figure out how to get around whoever's coming at you. Yeah, this, yeah. this was not an easy one. No, and, that and, sort and of if a you constant? got far enough along to make the extended play and you got up to that bridge, yeah, that really super narrow thing that would just nail your car because you hit it so fast. It was it one lane or two lanes? It was tiny. It was tiny, yeah. And it would depend where on the screen you'd suddenly, you'd get a little bit of a flashing warning saying the bridge is coming up. But you didn't have any idea where it was going to appear, and of course you're trying to dodge cars at the same time. So <clears throat> I well, apparently you don't get penalized much for driving in the road, or, or I mean on the grass. At least it doesn't look like it. Well, you, you wouldn't get penalized. You'd slow down a little bit, but it it would make a lot of difference to whether you got the extended play or not. Mm. Yeah, depending on how much you drove on the side on the side rails. Yeah, it would slow you down enough so that you couldn't get extended play. Mm. Yeah, because I think if I remember you had to get a certain score in 90 seconds to get the extended play. Exactly, yeah. But yeah, this was a brutal one. Yep. Uh, we have quite a few racing games in here that are pretty brutal. <laughs> I think that's the racing game constant. So, one thing that I loved about this racing game was that no matter whether it was a stand-up console or the sit-down um, racing game or whatever, um, you knew exactly what you were supposed to do. You were just supposed to get around the other cars. It didn't have, you know, laser guns on it. It didn't have, you know, things you needed to jump over. Uh, no monkeys throwing barrels onto the road. It was just a straight racing game. And, and if you wanted a pure just racing game, see how fast you could be, this was it. Yeah, that was, it was what? very, very true. 83? Uh, 1980, I believe. 1980, yeah. Yeah, that, that was before I was even born. <laughs> I remember yeah. it in the arcade. Yeah, we had the, the sit-inside console version of the arcade that I frequented, which is kind of nice, because you actually got the sound speakers like right beside your head. Yeah, I think that, I think that's the one that's in the video right now. I, the guy on YouTube that was restoring one. I got the uh, the box, the wooden box in front of the stand-up console. So you had a, the low and high gear. Everything was on the front, so it was yep. at an awkward angle. Mm -hmm. It's like you were driving a ship or something. You still have the foot pedal on that one too, though, didn't you, on the bottom? Yeah, yeah. 
And you had a sit-down console was easier for that. Yeah, that would be weird trying to play a racing game standing up in front of a console with a steering wheel. It was very weird. And I remember it distinctly because we had to put uh, the box on the gas pedal and you had to balance the box because we were all too short to actually see the, the console. You had to balance the box and use the, bo the whole box as the gas pedal. Well, that probably would have been me too. I guess I'm showing my age here. I was tall enough to actually drive it kind of properly. So. Yeah, well, yeah. I've always been short. Yeah, I have that problem too. <laughs> Still. <laughs> all right. Well, next, which is all moving from what was it called? Sega Monaco GP. Yeah. Yep. Next, we have Sega Turbo. Which, this one. This, this one is one of the very first full color 3D, mm. if not yeah. the first full color 3D racing game. This came out a year before Pole Position did. Yeah, that actually looks pretty good. And this also was ported to consoles. This was one of the, the I think, the premier racing one on the ColecoVision, if I remember correctly, too. Yeah, yeah that, that's the version when I was searching around. That's the version I kept coming up with was the ColecoVision one. And, yeah, and to me, one... it's kind of a sequel to... Uh, the Monaco GP we just looked, just the 3D version of it, because you still get your ice roads, you still get your night driving. Yeah, and they actually else. look very similar. Yeah. That the little hills thing. But... Didn't this one also have uh, oil slicks in the road? Ice patches, oil slicks, I think it had a couple of those. And even Monaco, I think, had a couple <clears> things like that, too, you could hit. Isn't there a bridge you cross over into the other city? Yeah, there was, yeah. huh? That's right, yeah, I forgot about that. There yeah, was a bridge, and you had to either slow down or speed up, to because the other cars on this on this road is gonna, are going to cut you off, and they they don't have anything that harms them basically when it gets to that bridge. Yeah, the, the, this is before you had where you could actually damage opponent cars. Yeah, yeah, usually when when cars collided in these, it just made you spin out like you were in ice or whatever. Yeah. You just do a 360, and then you're off and running again at, at zero speed. <laughs> yeah, you have to start over again, basically. So you have to start to over again. Catch up to cars. Yeah. And there was a, a, Ooh, a leaderboard. Cool. I remember this one. There was a leaderboard on this machine, whatever machine you're sitting at. Um, and it shows, like, the top five or six. And uh, I always wanted to get up there, and I never could. Mm -hmm. No, I never could either. That was that was hard about those arcades. There's so oh, many you people had, that are you so You had some good. kids that were that. That's all they would do is play one racing game. Oh yeah, all, yeah. All. And you'd see like four or five quarters stacked up on the screen, to, to for the people in line to play the game. Yep. Yeah, I actually find that now with online leaderboards for just about any game is it's always impossible to get into those leaderboards because there's people that just eat, sleep, and breathe that game now mind you when when i was in their cases as, uh, as younger kids this would be late 70s early 80s i guess we used to sometimes cheat because we'd get the same thing you get frustrated because you could never get a high score compared to these guys but this was before they had non-volatile memory in a lot of these arcade yep. machines so you just unplug the thing and plug it back in wipe it back out to the default <laughs> voila you could get on the high score not for very long the other guy would come by again and you know and, and blast your square out of the water but you could get on for a few seconds as long as the arcade manager didn't catch you unplugging his machines in, in the late 70s, early 80s, the arcades were so full of people, they wouldn't have a chance to keep track of everything. Yeah, it was, you literally had four or five people on every machine waiting. Yeah, lined up, or, or watching, you know, in line, I think. And that's when the, the monitors came out where they would they would hook in another monitor above the game. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so everybody could watch you play. And if yeah. you were really good, you, you know, you'd get the, the bragging rights for being amazing at Monaco or whatever. And if you were really bad, you would never play that machine. No. Nope. everybody would rag on you for the whole night. Oh, yeah, I saw how fast you went. Yeah, no, that's, that's not what that game is supposed to look like when you play it. And if you did really bad, then the people behind you would be even more impatient to go play it. Because, Come on, just get off. Yeah, they, they, they saw you were so anyway. bad, and I can do so much better, and... Yeah. You, you, oh, you get razzed. And, and so whenever I would always look for machines that were like off in a corner, mm -hmm. no one else was around them, 
then I go play those for a while and get good and then go find one that had an extra monitor on top to go yeah. show off. Yeah. All right, well, next up we have going from sporadic nighttime levels on these to an entirely nighttime based. Ah, uh, the classic night driver. Not to be confused with Night Rider. No, this is a way before Night Rider. <laughs> None of these cars talked. No, they they just squeaked. I mean, this is purely black and white. The col the color car you see in the front was actually a sticky label on the on the monitor. Oh it's yeah, I, I, I've seen kids' toys where they do that. And this this is very old. This is from 1976 by Atari. Um, yeah. I think it's the very first 3D perspective racing game. Period. I think I remember. Is. I do remember there were some semi-mechanical ones that used to be in the arcade. I don't know if any of you remember those. They actually had a, a plastic model car that you steered with your steering wheel. They do actually just move back and forth. Mm, and there was, yeah. uh, that, that's and it was a, a clear that's plastic little... picture of a racetrack that just kept rotating through backlit. Yeah, that that that's the kids' toy that I've that I've seen where they basically duplicated that. Yeah. Stick a steering wheel onto a little rolling sheet of paper. Yeah, pretty much, and that's that's actually what was in the arcades before Night Driver came along. This is when you actually got a video game out of it. Yeah, we actually had a TV screen showing you real video. And this well, is one of the cases, like how, you're showing the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I don't know how real of a video it was. It was, you know, it was an electronic form of that same old paper cutout, but, you know, in a pinch. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got to start somewhere, I guess. Yeah. And right now you're showing the Atari 2600 version of it. And yep. You'll notice it's actually in color, so it's actually an improvement over the original arcade game, which is not much you could say for too many 2600 games. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, the, well, that... I don't know. Pastel colors were, were all the rage, right? That's why 2600 <laughs> was what it was. I mean, The 2600 actually has trees and stuff there, too, which you didn't have on the original arcade game. Yeah. Trees, and I think there was houses, even. Yeah. But I guess you have to remember that Night Driver, the arcade version, actually came out before the 2600 was ever released, too. So. Mm -hmm. Though some okay. games actually took a downgrade on the 2600 going from an arcade. Yeah, if you take the really early ones. I mean, basically, this is the equivalent of Pong hardware, just about. Yeah. But I will have to stand up for the Atari 2600's honor here. The, the Christmas that we got one in the house, the 26th, 27th, and 28th, I did not see outside. No, I don't think there, any of us did when we got that. There was no such thing as outside. I played the Tank Wars game. I played, um, you know, combat. Every, combat and Breakout and, you know, all the different games you could possibly play that were, you know, the, the 12 or 15 games that they had out. Um, my parents splurged and no one got presents, but we had a 2600. And yeah, and that was basically the same. Turn. That was the same right. with us too. I mean, I had seen the Magnavox Odyssey two mm -hmm. in a couple of stores before that. I mean, with much coarser graphics, so that was the first, you know, commercial video game home system. But the games just they weren't getting licensed games. I mean, they got a few later on, but not too many. Yeah. But Atari actually, because they were an arcade manufacturing company at the same time, actually was bringing good titles, and of course the graphics and sound were much better than the Magnavox. So it it just took off. Yeah. And. And everybody, by the end of the, the following year, everybody had a 2600, and game swapping just went yes. rampant. Yeah, because those kids, we couldn't afford too many cartridges, so you had to game swap. Yeah, you, you would bring games into school at Show and Tell and show the different games and say your high score and, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. And then at game recess, you'd go huge. behind the school, and you'd give your friend your cartridges, and he'd give you your cartridges, and... Well, it, it was also trade because combat everyone got, right? Yeah, so it came with the console. Had, mm. Yeah, if you had combat, eh, no one's going to trade with you. But if you had, you know, something like uh, Night Driver here or um, later on they, you know, they, they ended up with like Spy Hunter and other car racing games. If you had these cartridges, they were hot items. So you could trade for two or three other not so great games. But you'd get three, and they would only have one of your cartridges, and then you'd swap back. Yeah, and then you actually had other other uh, companies later on in the Atari's life that were coming out. Like I think Activision made Enduro, which was kind of a pole yep. position style clone. So, 
you know, enduro and then enduro uh, had a night driving and everything to it. Yeah. All right. Well, should we move on then to pole position? One and two. I'm not sure how long a difference there was between the two, but they look pretty. One year. I say they look very, very similar, and they actually play quite similar. Yeah. So the, the big innovation with pole position too, like pole position, the first one we're looking at now, this came out in 1982, uh, the year after Turbo came out, and of course this had a, like real corners when you steered in the corners, it actually made a difference. Yeah. Into the, whereas with Turbo, you just went left and right on the screen. The car I mean, the didn't actually turn. Left and right, but you didn't really have to steer the track that much. Pole position, you did. Pole position two basically just added alternative courses, I think, for the most part. Because you had four different racetracks you could pick. Yeah. Yeah. This did the other a... did the other racing games have gears? Because this has high and low. Yeah, most of them, most of them did, if not all. Yeah, of them. most okay. of them did. I think pole position was the first one that, that came out where you could, in the, at least in the arcade, you could switch between first through fourth. Was it this one or was it a, another one? Uh, I don't think I... it up. See the the one I I always played. I think it was just high and low. Yeah, just high and low. I remember too. Just high and low. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get to like 170 or 160, you had to switch up to high to keep going. Yeah. Another interesting thing about pole position. I think it's one of the first video games I remember seeing that actually had in-game advertisements. Because yeah. you see the oh, billboards yeah. whipping buyer for other Atari games like Centipede, etc. Yeah, I remember um, trying to figure out on each individual track, what were all the different billboards and stuff. Just, yeah, I tried doing that too, but then I tended to crash a lot because I was too busy paying attention to the damn Exactly. Thing. And when you're shelling out quarters, because, because all of these games came out as an arcade game first, and, and you know you had to go shell some quarters out to get, to, to get a taste of the game, and then yeah. later on it would become a cartridge and you'd get good at it, and then you could go show off for your friends at the arcade. Uh, but by that time, no one wanted to play pole position. It was, you know, something else. Yeah. But yeah, this is an iconic game. This one, yes. people would line up to play this game. I remember at the university arcade, and this would have been years after pole position came out. This would have been probably five or six years after it came out. It was still lined up then. Wow. By people. It was just... Because everybody just loved the game, everybody grew up with it, and it was, you know, still a yeah. pretty good, decent racing game. Well, yeah, no, uh, that, also, they've included this on just about every Namco um, arcade collection that they've released on all the consoles, and it was it, just such a hit. Yeah, and it, even now, it, it's still a pretty decent racing game. Well, to give you an idea of how widespread it is, I mean, you can get pole position for the iPod Classic, and there's only like 30 games for that thing in the first place. <laughs> wow, and this is one of. Them. I actually have it on mine. <laughs> and the click wheel actually is, does pretty good as a steering wheel. I have to say that the acceleration sucks, but the mm. steering is good. What's an iPod? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the one that was supposed to be asking that question. <laughs> it's, it's something they grow eye beans in. Ah, uh, right on. <laughs> I'm a little bit behind on the technology. <laughs> You should have been riding home with Night Driver then. <laughs> and this is pole position two. This is where you got the four tracks. Uh, the car's slightly redesigned, etc. But basically, it's the same, same hardware, same gameplay, just with with different tracks, with different hairpin turns and stuff. You had to kind of memorize. And um, better explosions. Yes. Yes. Those explosions always got better. Uh, Much closer to how I really drive my car. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm glad you're in another state. Other country, actually. <clears throat> All right. Next, we the next actually isn't really a racing game per se. You're breaking up, Joshua. Oh, sorry. I was moving away from the mic. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's hard for people to hear me anyway. So yeah, I, I suppose moving from the mic. Anyway, this is a. Are there any other games kind of like this? This, to me, seems sort of a weird, not racing, driving kind of game. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that has a that uses a car like this, but there are other variants of this kind of game. 
Okay. Yeah, because basically you're navigating a maze of, of tracks and you're trying to collect flags and fuel and stuff. And actually, uh, I did a little bit of research on the hardware. This actually is based on the Pac-Man hardware. Oh, so yeah, yeah because it looks a lot like Pac-Man. You can, like you can Pac get a conversion board for it and actually just change the ROMs out. And basically, this is on the Pac-Man you know, graphics chip sound chip. Yeah, and, and the game actually is kind of like Pac-Man. You move around a maze collecting things and avoiding other things. Yeah. yeah, so you can definitely see where the, the basis for it is. Uh-huh. Now, I don't understand where uh, the... Good. You ever see that, Car Wars? Yeah, I played Car Wars. I also played uh, later, you know, more recent uh, Carmageddon, which was also fun. But um, this one um, was always fun, but it was frustrating as hell. Just for the sheer fact that uh, you had to not only look for the flags, and depending on what color the flag was, it was different points, but you also had to make sure that you had smoke screens so that the people that were chasing you, the other cars that are chasing you, that, that are literally trying to crash into you, you know, flounder in the smoke or whatever, and you don't run out of fuel. And you don't yeah. hit the rocks or potholes. Yep. And you had to watch out for the terrain as well. So. Well, plus Not the fact that game. the controls are kind of weird and that the car will automatically turn. Is it like right or something? When it hits a wall, it'll automatically turn. So you have to make sure you're right on pushing the direction where you actually want to go. And I don't know, the weird sort of 360 turning kept always threw me off. It took me a while to kind of figure out which direction actually turned me in the direction I wanted to go. Yeah, it was confusing because of the orientation of your car. It kind of confused you. You'd think, oh, i got to turn to the left, but I'm going down, so actually I've got to turn the other way with the steering wheel. Yeah, it wasn't exactly intuitive. Yeah, it did take a bit. I could get to used to. Yeah. Fun game, nonetheless. I, yeah, I once you got used to it, it was, it, was a, it was a blast. But that initial curve, I think a lot of people actually gave up on the game you know, at, at first, because they tried a couple times, like, ah, I just can't get this, and they just kind of skip on to something. Else. Oh yeah, and that, and that makes sense because the first Rally X, I don't think, did quite as well. The new Rally X, which was basically just sort of a enhancement that they laid over on top of the original, did better, and I, they made it slightly easier. But I think new Rally X did better than the original. That, that wouldn't heard. surprise me from what I remember it. But by then, people had played the original Rally X, and then they tried the new Rally X, and by that time, they've kind of gotten used to it and know how to play it. All right. Next, continuing in our sort of non-racing-ish trend here, we have Spy Hunter. One of my all-time favorites. This was a blast to play. Love and, this game. And hard. Didn't they just come out with a new version like a couple years back? Yeah, there. I don't yes. think I've played, but it was like the PS2 and Xbox and GameCube, I think, all got a new updated version of Spy Hunter. Yeah. This was I remember absolutely the a great game. Yeah, and I remember the arcade cabinet, they had incredibly loud speakers. I don't know if that was standard for the machine yeah. or if it was just where we were, right above your head in stereo so you were getting like helicopter sounds and machine gun fire and everything else just blasting at your brain constant while you're playing the game it was just and they had that great steering column too with the buttons yeah. on either uh i loved playing that in the arcade yeah because you had a separate button for each of your weapons your smoke screen your yeah right. like, etc and even on the the gear shift there was a, a weapon button as i recall yeah actually, what was that one I think that might have been like uh, for the smoke screen or for the uh, the oil, maybe. I think maybe for the oil, but yeah, this the just seeing the trailer truck up ahead was always a, a godsend because I was nearly dead every time I saw that stupid truck. Yeah, then you have to drive on the back of it. And... Yeah, you have to drive up on, onto the back and get into the back of the truck to get to the next mission. Yeah. And then if you were good enough, you'd actually get to the water sequence where you get to turn into a boat for a bit and start shooting other boats. Yep. The, the boat was always fun, but there were some things you could crash into and some things that would just blow up the boat. I yep. seem to always find the blow up the boat ones. <laughs> I don't I, know why. I always had I a hard... Magnet or something. I, I have a hard... When I'm playing this, I have a hard time figuring out which 
cars are the good cars and which cars are the bad cars because they all looked the same. On the they arcade version, no... they were pretty separate because I mean, most of the enemy cars were all that dark navy blue type thing, and then your your and other ones like big, don't forget were, like, the big hearse looking cars, right? Yeah. Where the guy would lean out with a shotgun at yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I was I was playing the NES port, which I think was kind of buggy anyway. That that could have been my problem. Yeah, the other nice thing, thing about it was the Peter Gunn theme song to it, because especially the arcade version. Like I'm hearing the Nintendo version right now, and it's it's nowhere near as good as the arcade one was. But it was just a nice thumping, you know, good one. And doing a little bit of research on it, I guess originally they were trying to get the uh, James Bond theme. In fact, the prototypes of the game actually did yeah. have that. Yeah. And they just couldn't get the licensing straightened out. So they... Well, yeah, because everything about it basically screams James Bond. James you know? Bond, yeah, exactly. His decked out fancy car. And... He has Aston Martin, I think. Yeah. Yeah, this was, a, this was absolutely a must play when it came out in the arcade. Everyone wanted to play Spy Hunter. If you were playing Spy Hunter, um, you were at least watching it. Everyone yep. was wowing about, you know, what the graphics look like and how the roads, you know, bend uh, would bend and turn and twist. And then when you when the first person that I remember changed from a car to a boat in the arcade, everyone was like, "Oh my God, look, he's a boat now!" It was a huge deal. Yeah, because um, that was darn hard to get to. It was well. It was not only was it darn hard to get to, but um it, the arcades were loud they were packed with people they were hot they were i mean people did not want to be in there for you know 20 30 minutes at a, at a time just playing one game oh speak for um, yourself <laughs> <laughs> you you wanted to get around and talk with friends and play a bunch of games with other people and it, it, this took some time and some some dedication to get to that the water level yeah. And so when someone actually did get there, everyone stopped what they were doing and went over and looked. So yeah, yeah so it was, was pretty a pretty game. rare. It, it happens. So well, it didn't. And, uh, some oh, sorry, go ahead. wasn't some you could go into water, and some it was mandatory. There was like optional water areas. Fair. Was that when you took I, one of the two side bridges? I can't remember now. So I, I, I thought I read that also. somewhere that it was. You could go into water on some areas. In other areas, it was a mandatory. This next level is a water level. Oh, it boy. might be like on the bridge you're showing now. Maybe one, if you took one route, you'd convert to the boat, and if the other route, you just yeah. stay on the bridge. Okay, that sounds semi-familiar. Yeah, I mean the the nice thing about this 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 game was another one that remained popular for a long time after, like pole position did. Because at the university, the last year I went to university, which would have been 1990. Uh, and this game was released in 83. It was still popular then. You'd still occasionally get lineups. Not huge ones, but I mean, for a seven-year-old game, that was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, any game that's seven years old that's still lining people up in arcade when it's already ported to every console you can think of. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Next up, moving on to the consoles. And also... Still not quite a racing game, but still a popular driving game. So this one I haven't, I didn't play much. I, we used to have it on our Nintendo, but I was never very good at it. I think I always kept overheating the car, or the, the bike. Because I think at that time on racing games, braking was sort of a foreign concept to me. I mean, <laughs> you're driving a car, why do you use a brake? You know, I still see that symptom on rush hour these days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No matter what city you're in, you, you always see that. <clears throat> Plus, this has a whole, whole jumping dimension to which I guess, uh, arcade wise, I guess the nearest equivalent for the old style stuff, I guess, would be bump and jump. And you, and you also had to pull back on the handlebars on this one, right? To, to pull I, the front wheel up? I don't you did remember. Jump? You might have, I thought there was some sort of phys, there was some sort of physic element like. The, what is it that game on um, 
Xbox Live now. That's sort of, yeah, that's sort of like I remember this. this one. This one, you had to when you're doing a jump, you can you could just go over it, right? But if you pushed back on the on the controller at the apex of the jump, your front tire would come up, and you could land on the back tire, and then you'd land a better jump that way. Mm. If you didn't pull back on it, um, you'd land on your front tire first and sometimes roll the bike. Yeah. Yeah, I think I remember that. I think I did a lot of I, rolling. I remember that now, too, that you mentioned. Yeah, you did have to try to pull the front tire up, just like you, you would in real life, I guess. Yeah, you you had to pull it up so you land on the back tire, and if you landed on the back tire and you weren't going too fast and you weren't braking, you'd land the jump and you'd be able to continue on. But if you... If you pulled back and, you know, you braked or you pulled back and you hit the gas, you would slip out from underneath or you, you know, you'd crash. And the crashes on these were hysterical because the bike would go and wobble and then you would crash. Yeah, and it would spin off to the side. Off, and and then you'd have to run back to the bike and get back on the bike and start it up and then you could go. Yeah, and now that I think about it, I think this did have some sort of racing competitive element where you had, didn't, wasn't there a mode where you had several other computer-controlled bikes? Oh, yeah, there was at least three other bikes on the course, and you had to, you know, depending on your, your time and how hot the bike got and whether you just held the, the A button down for acceleration the whole time um, or if you let off and went around corners or whatever, um, the temperature on the bike would heat up. Remember mm -hmm. that? And yeah. If you got too hot, it would just it, the bike would just crap out. Basically, it would just stop working, and, and then the temperature would come back down. Then you could go again. Yeah, that, that's what always threw me off. Ha having yeah. to brake on a racing game is just too <laughs> weird. I, I've gotten used to it now with a little more modern. Brake? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was just going to say, I was remind me later not to get escorted around town by Joshua. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drive yet, so you don't have anything to worry about. I, yeah, I can see why if you don't know what a brick is. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, we, we don't have to worry about that for this moment. But yes, the, the roads are know. still safe. Yeah. But yeah, this is, this was a, an excellent game. Um, caused many an uproar in my house. Um Lots of you cheated, lots of, uh, I wasn't going that fast, stop pushing the A button, uh, I didn't want to go fast, you know, lots of arguments on this game. And, and in true form, any game that caused lots of arguments was a better game. Because there were lots of things that you could cheat on or do or, and I believe this was the first one that had obstacles that, that you could avoid and my sisters would always push me into the obstacles. <laughs> so yeah, this was this was definitely a fun game, but one of the more um, argumentative games in the house. Highly competitive. Highly competitive, yes. All right, then we we'll move on to the Super Nintendo with one of my all-time favorite racing games. Th this is the one that we used to play all the time. The original Top Gear. Sadly, my house did never didn't get into the SNES as much. Um, we were stuck with the, the regular Nintendo. Yeah, we, we had time. we had the Nintendo for quite a while. It took it took a while before we got, actually got the Super Nintendo. But when we did, this is one of the games we had, and we played it all the time. We always had a blast with it, even though we were all pretty young and not very good at it. <laughs> I, I remember my youngest sister. She would never drive on the road. She would always drive on the grass. So we would always call her the lawnmower. <laughs> Very nice. Always a positive thing to, to rag yes. on sisters. Isn't that the point to these games, though, to be able to drive how you can't really in real life? 
Oh well, yeah, kinda. It, like, like say for example, a, yeah. <laughs> That's that a good example. Be, that definitely became a theme with uh, you know, card games like Carmageddon and whatnot, but or Burnout or Death Race Two Thousand when they made the video game version of that. Yep, Death Race Two Thousand. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't know the the this game looks. I, I sadly I've never played this one. This is one of the few that I've I've never played, but excellent looking game. Yeah, and this this actually had I think pit stops. You had because I, th I think you had a limited amount of gas, so you would have to like an actual like NASCAR type race. You'd have to time your stops at a pit stop. To... Now I'm wondering because of that, because of like the split screen look here, where you got the two, you have screens, you've got your map of the thing. I'm assuming you had to go in for tire changes and fuel and stuff like that too to pits. I think so. I, I definitely remember that there were. I think it was gas. I don't know if the tires were affected. If that was the thing, or there was definitely something you had to go into a pit to get serviced it... to keep going. <laughs> Otherwise this you... this really reminds me of an older game um, by Epix that was out on a lot of the computers and consoles called Pit Stop 2 and Pit Stop, mm. which is kind of the same thing. Much simpler graphics back then because this is back in the Apple II you know, type days. But the gameplay actually looks very, very similar, just really better graphics and, and, and sound, obviously. Yeah, I, I don't remember what the Pit Stops were for exactly. I, I, just, I just remember... You had to, to have time. something else to do. Yes, you had to time them just right, otherwise your car would conk out, which I actually had during a race. My car actually did conk out right in front of a pit stop. Oh. Yeah, and, and in pit stop, too, I remember doing that a lot because you'd, you'd get tire wear if you kept hitting other cars with it, and eventually mm. your tire would just conk yeah. out. Though I was lucky enough, I was clo I, I was right in front of the pit stop, like a, just a little bit away from it. And the computer car would kept lapping me and kept not hitting me, so I just turned the wheel and I ended up getting slammed into the pit stop by other cars, because you know the computer doesn't really avoid you; it just kind of goes through you. And I got knocked into the pit stop, got serviced, and kept racing. Nice. Uh, I think you were laughing at you. <laughs> it might have been both. <laughs> All right, well, we move on to the shifting to kart racers. And, of course, you can't talk about racing games without talking about Mario Kart. Mario anything. Mario is console gaming. Yeah, pr pretty much. And, and this one was shocking. This, because this one had everything that Mario for the regular SNES had, but it was all themed in racing. Mm -hmm. Genius. Absolutely genius game. And it even took a few cues from the Donkey Kong arcades with the bananas and mm -hmm. the, um, even had Donkey Kong Jr. as a playable character. Captain Princess, she was there. She was the first appeared in the Donkey Kong games as well. No, actually, that's not Princess Peach. It's not. No, in in you you missed our episode where we covered Donkey Kong. That's actually Pauline. No, you're right. Yeah, Cur Curtis, you were, you were on that episode where we did all the Donkey yeah. Kong games. Yeah. And I think. She, it was, she was like a brunette or something. But yeah, th this was a very... I think this basically set the standard for a lot of racing games, especially the kart racing games. Yeah, the kart no, racing no, games. Yeah. Was, was Mario the, basically the first franchise that actually went into the racing genre from a different genre to begin with? That could very well be, because... <laughs> Usually, you don't think you saw franchises crossing genre as much. Yeah, I think until this one, because I mean, before I mean, you obviously had Mario appearing in, in Donkey Kong, and, and then having Mario Brothers, etc. And then you know, they just kept jumping between. Yeah, uh, Mario actually 
did jump between a lot of genres early on. Well, the the guys at Nintendo were, you know, kind of famous for coming up with the next new thing. Yeah. And they always made you feel really comfortable by using the Mario um, and, you know, older um, characters to to introduce you to a new thing. Mm -hmm. And and they did that again with uh, Mario Kart and, you know, whatever Nintendo wanted to do, they, they usually had Mario do it first if it was something that, that they're putting you know, a significant amount of their, their time into. Mario was like the gateway drug. <laughs> exactly. Totally. He was totally the gateway drug. Mario, it can be akin to pot. <laughs> Everyone was curious about it. Everyone kind of knew what was going on with it. They'd go over to a friend's house. Maybe Mario would be on. They'd try, watch. Try some you know, out. Check it you out got a little the bit. You, you all had the munchies around Mario. Everyone had fun. You know. That explains all the mushrooms too. You know. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, they are they're... magic mushrooms, aren't they? They are yeah, indeed. Yes. Magic, magic uh, these, super mushrooms. These mushrooms walk and talk as well. So <laughs> very um, subtle. I'm surprised the United States government didn't ban all these. <laughs> yeah, they absolutely should have banned them, and people should have sued too, because their kids, you know, got into deeper gaming, and you know, they're they're playing shooters or you know, first person shooters and and side scrollers, and they got into Contra Brothers and all kinds of other stuff, and you know, this was it. This was this is what started it. Yeah, they were worried about everything else, but they should have been worried about Mario. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were very sorry. The only about thing it. That, that's going to skew this analogy is Mario was never, that I know of, I could totally be wrong, never sought after by the state of California as a medicinal use kind of game. No medicinal use of Mario that I know of. Uh, well, there was a lot of addiction. That, yes. Definitely addiction, not necessarily. No one tried to pass it off as a glaucoma thing. Uh, you know, I have bad eye-hand coordination. I need some Mario. None of that. I do remember parents complaining that playing video games was going to cause you to go blind, though. So it... yeah, yeah, there, that's there a was. different subject altogether. <laughs> different scenario. But it, what? And wasn't this one the first one to? to kind of combine a shooter because because didn't all of these guys have different things that they did um uh, the turtle like shot out turtle shells and no that 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 feature didn't come till later this I mean there were all of the turtle shells and the bananas and whatever that you could fire but they weren't unique to any specific character you just you ran over an item panel and you'd get an item like a turtle shell okay, or a banana yeah, yeah. and then you would fire it at your opponent Yeah, and I think this is also one they didn't keep this in some of the more recent iterations where drive where you would again taking in the Mario theme of the coins, where driving over the coins would actually make your car go faster. So that that, that was also another objective is you're avoiding all these obstacles and whatnot. Collecting all the coins so it wasn't purely a contest of skill they, they added a lot of the randomness of the items and the collecting the coin to make your car go faster I, th I think that they were trying to sort of make the racing game accessible to everyone so it wasn't just a matter of skill and having those items they try to throw a little luck at the draw so people that weren't maybe weren't quite as good would have a chance but slipping well, there was also up. the 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 owner of the game was the best at the game. I mean, <laughs> the number of hours you spend in front of it definitely increases your odds of winning the race. Yes. So, I mean, if you had friends over to play this, you were usually picked as the, the winner before the race even started. Unless your friends all had it at home, too. Very true. Very true. Number of hours equals number of races won. Yes. Um, let's see what we got next. I think going on to another.
Kart Racer, this time on the Nintendo 64. I think this came out after <clears throat> the 64 version of Mario Kart. But Diddy Kong Racing took a very had a very interesting take on the Kart Racer. This is not one that I picked up. I played it a couple times. It was not my cup of tea personally. Yeah, it, it it it's it has its cool qualities. Um definitely very little kiddish so you love it or hate it but the idea of having a racing adventure game was very odd i don't know how successful they were with it because i don't know the, the adventure yeah. portion of it, it seemed a little forced yeah the, from what i remember the character selection was fun but well, yeah, because well, they actually for me. <laughs> yeah, they actually pulled in because it being a, it's a rare game, and they actually pulled in characters from their other franchises. I think Banjo Kazooie yep, was ba in here. Banjo's in here. Conker is in here. Yep. Um, Crunch, which he looks suspiciously like a Kremlin from Donkey Kong Country. Mm -hmm. Um, no idea who Whizpig is, but then you have, of course, Diddy Kong. The Donkey Kong is absent from this. I think Whizpig is from uh, Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah, I think this was also one of the first Nintendo 64 cartridges to use the ru the Rumble Pack add-on. Ah, uh, the Rumble Pack. That big, huge, bulky thing you stuck into your already ginormous controller. The the reason that you did weightlifting in the morning is to make sure that you could lift the rumble pack. Yeah, exactly. But I think the coolest thing about this game, and aside the, the adventuring, take it or leave it, I don't, it wasn't a huge deal, an interesting idea, but the, I think the coolest aspect of this game was the multiple vehicles you could play as. When you went into a race, you could choose, depending on, it, it depended somewhat on the course you were doing, but you could choose to drive a car, a hovercraft, or an airplane. Which was sort of interesting because then the race tracks were laid out where you would have access to different routes or shortcuts or whatever, depending on what vehicle you drove. And of course, the hovercrafts could go could go over water, but they were a little more drifty on roads, a little tougher to control. And the cars, of course, having the superior traction, and then the airplanes, of course, you could just fly over everyone. But that's like. So my question would be, why don't you just pick a plane every time? Was there a, a downside to having a plane? Well, they controlled a little differently because you actually control it like an airplane, like you know, with a little flight stick go up and down and back and forth or whatever um i think they might have been a little trickier because the your track the track you took was a little less laid out you, you, you had a little more freedom and a little a greater chance of hitting obstacles and scenery because when you're, when you're on the road you know they're Obviously, this is sort of depend on the track, but when you're on the road, there's a fairly limited number of obstacles. But when you're in an airplane, you have to deal with the scenery. Like the tunnel that you just sort of drove in as a car, you would have to fly through the hole, like a thread, like threading a needle through there. And the item. So it became more 3D, right? You had to basically yeah. de deal with that z axis as well yeah they were a little trickier so you know despite everyone dream of you know when you're, you're driving a racing game oh if i could just fly over everyone it'd be so much easier it, a it actually wasn't all that much easier i imagine the steering was a lot more coarse for the airplane too wouldn't it be yeah de definitely adding that extra axis made it tricky especially when, when you're trying to collect like little item balloons or going through speed hoops 
having that third yeah. axis. I would see that there are a lot of planes on the sides of, of mountains just after a speed hoop. Yeah, otherwise this was a pretty fun Mario Kart clone. They even had the battle mode or battle royale, whatever they called it. I think this also, this may have been the first one to have item stacking. When you would grab, the items were separated by type. So there was only like four or five different items. There was like a, you had your projectile, you had your drop, op, you had your little, little course obstacle drop, you would have your sp power speed up thing, stuff like that. But if you collected like two rockets in a row, instead of the one, instead of the second one just canceling out since you already had an item, it would stack onto your existing rocket and now you would have like three rockets that you could fire. And if but you, would it would it go twice as fast or would it go for twice as long? No, I, depending the I, they function differently the, the, each item. But like the rockets, one rocket, that's one shot. You know, you you fire at your yeah. opponent. You grab a you grab a second rocket on top of that rocket, and now you would have a triple rocket barrage, so you could fire three separate ones. Oh, okay. And okay. if you grabbed a third rocket, you know, without firing any of those off you would get a super mega um, <laughs> the <Ultra>. palm <laughs> nuke that you could fire off at like the person in first place or something like that. And the same with like the speed boosts. Collect one speed boost, you get a little short burst of speed. Collect two, you get a longer burst of speed. And you collect three and you get a hyper speed boost. So an interesting sort of adds a little strategic element to, to item play on that. All right, the next up, moving on to a Sega, back to a Sega game. This is another sort of Mario Kart clone. And this is Sonic R is probably one of the only Sonic racing games that made a slight amount of sense. I think it's the only Sonic <laughs> racing game where Sonic actually ran the race. He wasn't shoved into some slow car, which I I, I always I never understood why a Sonic racing game Sonic had to drive a car. Well, it's a racing game. I mean, people like their their you know their genres defined. If it's a racing game, you got to be in some sort of automobile or you know at least something with wheels on it, right? Yeah, the, the the only person with wheels in this was Amy, and then Dr. Robotnik was in his little hovercraft thingy. Otherwise, everyone else, it was an entirely a foot race. Which would make sense, because I mean, that Sonic's claim to fame is his speed of running. Yeah, and so yeah. That, that, that's why, I mean, it, it still is a little odd why Sonic is even bothering racing with anyone else, because, I mean, it's obvious Sonic would win in a foot race. But, yeah... Definitely a little more logical. Now, I actually, th this didn't get rave reviews when it was released on the Sega Saturn. But I actually, th I actually thought thought it was sort of fun. There wasn't a whole lot of variety because I think you had like five courses, maybe six at the most. Um, there were a lot of sort of shortcuts and side paths and stuff like that that you could find. Okay, one of the tracks, there's if you, if you do it right, there's a shortcut where you can finish the entire track in like 20 seconds or something ridiculous like that. And it, it also had its own, its very own soundtrack. Like real, real music with real vocals and lyrics, which were and some some people criticize as it feeling sort of Disney-ish, 
with their all positive, upbeat, happy-go-lucky soundtrack. I don't know. It depends on on who this game is aimed at, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a Sonic game, so it was obviously aimed at the... Maybe younger. Yeah, y younger kids, not, not your hardcore... Um, Gran Turismo or simulation. Yeah, this is... It's not trying to compete with uh, Gran Turismo or anything. It's it's just trying to, you know, deliver a racing game that's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. And I think for the most part it did that. The controls take a little getting used to, especially depending on the character you do. So they, they can be a little unintuitive or a little jerky. But otherwise it's not too bad. And there's actually... They kept with the Sonic theme of you actually... There's Chaos Emeralds sprinkled throughout the courses... What did they do in this level? Uh, in this one, that the to get the Chaos Emeralds, you have to have a certain amount of rings, go through a gate with the ring, you know, the different gates require a certain amount of rings. So mm -hmm. you go through a gate, you can find the Chaos Emerald, you get the Chaos Emerald, but then you have to finish in first place to actually keep it. And after you collect all seven Chaos Emeralds, you unlock the character Super Sonic, which is... Obviously Sonic, but super fast, and he can float over water for a short time, and you know, double jump insanely high. Well, because he's super, right? Yeah. And on the final unlockable racetrack, if you play it as Super Sonic, you got a different um, sound song to go with it. I would hope you got a different ending as well. Yes, I think you got a little... Well, at this point, any endings amounted to um, a credit screen where basically you... If you didn't have all the Chaos Emeralds when you finished it, it said, go back and collect all the Chaos Emeralds. And if you did have all the Chaos Emeralds, it would have all of them with all the Chaos Emeralds and great job! Yeah, definitely not a horrible racing game. Sort of a, I, w I would call it sort of a hidden gem, and it was actually aptly included on the release of the Sonic Gems collection for the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox, or whatever they released those for. All right, well, next up, we have another, another Nintendo 64 racing game, F-Zero X, the sequel to the original F-Zero on the Super Nintendo. And th this one I actually never played until recently, and I instantly fell in love with it. The, 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 this is definitely one of the better game, one of the better games of this this type. F Zero was fun, but F Zero X just came back with so much more. The graphics yeah. were better. Everything was better about it. Cool, because it, it you had completely three D looping roller coaster like tracks. You were like the cars were super super fast. The, 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 this goes back to my um, who needs brakes? Dang <laughs> it, <laughs> racing. F zero, Doing there are breaks. no breaks. There was an arcade game that was kind of along this line too, from a bit earlier than this one. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It was one of the very first high res arcade games where they actually kicked the graphics up a notch. Not not as good as this, but it would have been the mid to late eighties. Obviously, if I can figure it out later. But it had those looping ramps and. All that kind of stuff. You were yeah, but it almost felt like you were driving a roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, similar. Yeah, I mean this has this has flying cars. I mean, what what else do you need? Now, when did this one come out? In ninety? Was it ninety eight, ninety nine? Um, I am not sure. I have a hard time keeping track of dates. 
Um, Japan got it July 14th. We got it October 26th of 98. For the for the year and for the, the, the game that it was and all the different things you can do with it and the different people that can play it and, you know, all, it was an excellent game. Yeah, the four-player, multiplayer, the yep. Rumble Pack support. And I think this this was before they the Nintendo 64 got that um, uh, RAM upgrade that the later games required. Yeah, I believe it is. And, and you could play it a bunch of different ways, too. You could, you know, you could do time trial and everybody race. You could do, like, a Grand Prix kind of thing. You could and, kill each other off. Yeah, the like death race. Mode. Oh, uh, yeah, there were all different kinds of ways you could play this game. Of course, being a guy, we always blew each other up, but, you know. Oh, of course. Any game where you can race and blow each other up is always a hit. Uh, that That's what made the Burnout series so popular, too. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you've got to be able to go fast and blow each other up. That just Mad Max set the whole thing off, and it just went from there. Yeah, this one actually didn't have any items, so it wasn't a traditional kart racer. More of just a high-octane, insane speed, loop-de-loop. -loop. And it was just, a, depending on what character you picked, their car could do different things, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, and I'm not, there were, I know there was a ton of different characters, and I think you unlocked more, ranging from bizarre robots to weirdo aliens to cyborgs and crazy hippie looking <laughs> characters definitely a fun game though yeah and it was quite quite popular and it was spawned a couple a couple of sequels Yeah, I don't think each character had special abilities. I know different the looking cars. Different looking cars. I think the cars the, uh, obviously handle a little different. I think you, you could actually, before the race, you could sort of modify your car's handling and speed and whatnot. You could yeah, a couple of simple sliders to sort of. Yeah, they all. Was this the one where they all cost some sort of, you know, credits or coin or whatever it was that you collected during the race? I uh, don't... I, I haven't played this one much. I don't remember. I didn't notice that. But that could be. Especially like in a Grand Prix type of yeah. thing where you would spend your winnings to... Yeah, I don't know, because I, I, the sliders are were sort of a dynamic thing where when you increase one thing, you decrease others. Oh, so it may, okay, so it may have yeah. just been you just get to sort of tune the car to your style. If you wanted it to to be more grippy, you could do that, but it would cost you speed or something else. Yeah, and if you wanted to have really good acceleration, that would cost you speed. Also, that uh, game I was trying to remember that was kind of like a predecessor of this in the arcade was called Stun Runner by Atari. Yeah, that was an link. excellent game. Yeah, that actually looked pretty impressive for the graphics. Uh, Stun Runner was the first game that I know of that where you could spin it so that it went on the uh, uh, completely upside down through a pipe. Yeah, you could actually go flipping all the way around it. Yep. Yeah. And some of the racetracks required you to be able to do that. Because yeah, everything, you get those, you get everything on the bottom, bottom half of the pipe was, into, yeah. Because you run into and die from, so you had to do it. Yep. Oh, come on. There were little walls and stuff on the bottom half of the pipe. That yeah. was an excellent racing game. And you had to shoot, shoot other players or shoot, you know, uh, computer-controlled stun runners as well. 
And uh, the controls were weird too, because you had a regular steering thing, but the, the grips in both of your hands would move forward or back for speed. You twist forward for speed and pull back for braking. You had buttons for your thumbs and for your fingers. You did different things. Yep. All right, well, our next to last game is Sega Rally Championship for the Sega, Sega Saturn. Sega Rally Championship. Which I never actually got, I, I was never able to play that one. But from what I've heard, it was a landmark in racing games and sort of the oh, technology. Yeah. This was a predecessor to the Gran Turismo style of uh, tuner kind of racing games. It, I played it in the arcade quite a bit. Um, it had, you know, real scenery and um, it was very, they tried to do a more realistic. They oh. used real cars like the Toyota Celica and whatnot. Uh, Lancias and all the different kinds of rally cars. This was definitely a, 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 a game where someone was an enthusiast on racing, specifically rally racing, mm -hmm. and and they wanted that in a game. So um, Sega did a good job with this. They, it, it was uh, what I remember. It was desert and mountain. Um, there were some forests in there. Um, but yeah, you had to keep track of everything. You had to keep track of um, speed and where it wins the turn and how sharp is the turn and am I going to fall off the edge, all that stuff. Well, and this is the, I think, the first game to have different surfaces <laughs> that actually, with the different with different friction, that would actually affect your handling and driving. Yeah. yeah, the you know asphalt, gravel, mud, etc. That would affect your driving. So you had, to, you had to take that into account when you're driving. Yeah, this was a, one of the first ones that I remember, at least, that tried to to, to simulate what actual Three, race driving is like. Two, one, go. All right, well, since we're running a bit long, we'll jump on to our final game. Which is another one of my personal favorites. Gran Turismo on the PlayStation 1. Which also has one of my, one of my all-time favorite video game intros as well. What what intro was that? Uh, the, one, the one the one that's playing right now. The the intro to Gran yep. Turismo is. I I remember this one vividly. This is another one that we we would play a lot when we had the PlayStation. Gran Turismo was was the thing that made me fall fall in love with uh, the PlayStation itself. This game was just amazing it blew every other racing game out of the water well and especially when you look at the intro the graphics because it's a um full motion video intro so the graphics looks look absolutely incredible when, when you're when you're seeing the intro and they used real cars they yes. you know, they modeled all the cars off of actual real cars they had you know stuff like the Corvette in here and they had you know different Mazdas and, and Japanese cars in here they had Hondas and all kinds of different crazy cars and you could get in there and you could tune the cars you could sit there and race one track a hundred million times get used to that one track and trick out your car so it would compete on other levels yeah cause um, I think this is one of the first ones that actually had a full garage yep or something in it and this also this one had the simulation mode in it, if I'm not mistaken. So it was a... they had the they had like a third person where you could follow the car, and then you could also be in the car. Yeah, so you're right. Hands on the steering wheel and and play that way. 
This is an excellent game. I believe I still have this game. I have all of the Gran Turismo's. So, this is absolutely one of my favorite games, not necessarily racing game, but any game. It's the Gran Turismo line. Yeah, the first, I, I especially like the first one. Probably one of well, my the first favorites. one is, is them, you know, trying to figure out how do we take all of racing and put it into a game? How yeah, do we do, you know, one game. there's a lot of stuff that that people don't even consider, you know, the the traction of the car and what's considered, you know, what do you have to do to the traction? Do you have to change the tires? Do you have to change the braking? Do you have to change the, um, the shocks? What do, you, what do you have to do to get better traction? Um, what do you have to do to get, you know, higher end speed versus low grip speed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Grand Turismo tried to do as much as it could with what the game console had. And being a PlayStation, it was like the peak of, you know, Sony's always tried to push graphics and processing speed over, I don't know, playability or fun, if you yeah. will. They try to be more nitty-gritty, hardcore kind of game players. Mm -hmm. And this game kind of pushed that envelope as much as it could. Yeah, because this even had the separate single-player um, career mode where you would actually go through, you get your, like, driver's license, and then you had to do a series of tests, actual, like, real driving tests. Yeah, you had to start and stop in time. You had to, you know... Avoid cones or do make a turn without going onto the grass and all kinds yep. of stuff, and then you would compete. You had to do all and... the different things, and then once you, you completed those tasks, you got your driver's license, and you could, you know, open up a whole new circuit of, of stuff that you could do. Yeah, and then you had to like win races and get money to improve your license and ac get access to newer cars, and you'd have to buy new cars and parts. And yeah, but it, yeah, this I think that might this that might is have even kind of where it. the racing game starts. Honestly, uh, everything up to this point has been very fun racing, but the, when you're talking about kind of gearhead really hardcore into racing this is where this is where simulation racing starts yeah this really is because you have real cars you have real problems with cars you know uh, real you physics. need a better transmission you need a better you know whatever brakes tires engine whatever and you have to earn enough money to go and buy those things right mm -hmm. and if you had one kind of car you could sell that car and get a whole new one but you'd have you'd start at the bottom again you have to go through you know the oh, and, easy and you races got... that you've already completed to earn a bunch of money again to start tricking this car out and your car depreciated as soon as you bought it yep you never you always paid more than you could sell it for so yeah this is an excellent excellent game um but but not it it's not, it doesn't pretend to be anything other than it is. It, it, it's a gearhead kind of game. It's for people who are into racing or people who like cars and like car racing. And there's no, you know, there's no Mario Kart kind of feel to it at all. It's just for high graphics hardcore yeah, but, players. But there's not a banana peel or a turtle shell to be found anywhere. Exactly. And it was, it, they had excellent music in it too. The, yeah, some actual, you know, I think, um, licensed. They had uh, artists actually made yeah uh, music for the game. Yeah, the, it was a it was a big deal. They put a lot of money into this. Oh yeah, and, and being a PlayStation One game with the CD, CD with the CD ROM capabilities, they could store that much all that media. Yeah, on the on the game disc itself. Yeah, though I think they, if it was this one or the second one, they had for the single player career, they had to break that off onto a separate disc. I think it was the second one that started with the with the multiple discs, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, ever since the the I think it was the second one, they've had multiple you know big thick cases for yeah. <laughs> all the discs that you got, right? And then the latest one is in a DVD now, isn't it? 
The the latest one for the PS3 is on Blu-ray, so I, they obviously can store pretty much everything on there. Yeah, so so they went from regular CDs to DVDs to Blu-rays now. Mm-hmm. So oh, I actually didn't find the, the latest Gran Turismo to be quite as good. It, for some reason, it I felt have off. it at home and and I played with it a bit, but um, because now I have my own kids. And it's, you know, it's now their turn to play games and not, not so much mine. Mine yeah. to uh, take care of them and make sure that they can play them. Yep. But yeah, definitely, I, I absolutely love Gran Turismo. The, the whole genre is an excellent, excellent game. All right, well, I think that wraps us up for today of the whole bunch of racing games and we, we didn't even cover half of all the ones we could cover I, I may have to do another I'm going to have enough games to keep doing this podcast for years <laughs> oh yeah easily even just within a single genre you could you could stick with one machine and do it for years my friend <laughs> Yeah, especially some of those earlier ones. Um, I'm sure you have a plenty of games just with the Atari 2600 to run through, I don't know, several shows at least. Oh, yeah. Well, there was hundreds and hundreds of games of the 2600. And if you start getting to the actual, you know, the computers from back then, like the Apple II and stuff, you get into thousands. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the arcades, I mean, there's probably been over 10,000 of those. So. Yeah. So before we go, um, anyone have anything they want to promote where they can find you guys online? Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. You can find all my stuff. This is, this is Matt. You guys find all my stuff uh, at Skewed History on Twitter um, or skewedhistory.com. I'm going to be starting a, a podcast myself um, about um, what would happen if we took something in history changed it a little bit, and then followed it out to its natural end. Um, what happens if Hitler is now Polish? Um, what if uh, Napoleon waited until winter was over and then attacked Russia? So weird quirks in history. Um, if Steve Jobs and um, Bill Gates continued to work together, what would we have now? Um, so this is like the Turtle Dove books. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll be using a, a bunch of people, just uh, friends of mine and, and people around um, different chat, the Twit chat room. Um, we're all going to get together and, and go over these ideas and see what it's like. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, as am I. Interesting. Uh, Joel, where, where can people find you online should they want to follow your antics? I am Hobbit from PA, just about everywhere. And C Curtis, you said you have a website. I don't know how easy it is to remember. <laughs> <laughs> see, see well, if, if you see me in the chat rooms of CNET and, and uh, Twit, obviously I'm Curtis B. Nice and easy to remember. Um, as, and I have a retro game site, which I should have remembered last time. I totally forgot. Um, I, I grew up with a Tier City color computer, which Hobbit and I have been chatting about a little bit during the show here. And uh, I actually got a retro game site that I've done on that. And the address for that is nitrous9, which I'll explain. N-I-T-R-O-S-9 dot L-Curtis-Oil dot com slash coco underscore game underscore list dot HTML. And that's actually a site I'll be getting back to finally again here after a couple of your hiatus. Cool. And Did you need a longer URL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Josh and I were discussing that earlier. Yeah, I'll <laughs> see if I can fit that into the screen and post. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can might find... have to do a high def version so they can read it. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Joshua Caleb75 or just about anywhere else. And if you want to watch this show again or read my blog, I have a retro gaming blog as well, retrogamesforever.com. 
where I'll be posting this and I finally launched my rad segment, a retro a day, where I will be playing and reviewing one retro game every day and posting it up on there. And you can also subscribe to this there or on iTunes. Um, I have yet to see it in Zoom. I still don't know what the problem is. And I'm working on getting an email address to send comments or suggestions, suggestions to. But in the meantime, just at reply me on Twitter or leave a comment on the blog. So thanks everyone for watching and see you again next week in the past.